have slides or anything super special, I have an outline and I can point people to my website uh, when the talk is done. So if you want to get a copy of this outline, maybe I should have done printouts or something. Uh, but yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about cryptocurrency. Uh, who here has heard of cryptocurrency? I mean, I'm assuming you have because it's a topic in the class. Who here is really confused as, as to what it is? Cool. <laughs> so I'm going to try to fix that a little bit. And uh, even though I'm a giant computer science nerd, uh, I'm not going to go too deep into the computer science aspect of it. I want to talk about what it is, why you might find it interesting and useful, and you know, then we'll do some questions. We can talk about you know any confusion that you have about, like you said, proof of work or anything like that. So I kind of like to start off talking about cryptocurrency with how would you define it? Like, what is it? That's a good starting question. I like to think of cryptocurrency as a protocol for money in the same way that the internet is a set of protocols for information. So when you uh, talk about the internet, all the internet really is is it's a language that allows different computers all over the world to talk to each other and share information. So if you want to go to Wikipedia and look something up, or you want to go to Facebook and post a status about what you were up to this weekend, uh, your computer talks to other computers using a protocol, the internet protocol, you know, a bunch of, there's HTTP and all sorts of moving parts. Uh, but all you need to know about that, right, is it allows the free and open exchange of information. Anybody that has a computer can set up a website, can set up a web server that anybody else in the world can talk to. So you can share information, right? Uh, at the end of the day, that's all the internet is, is it's clients like you with your phone or your computer talking to servers that, uh, like Wikipedia, that's a database full of information. So cryptocurrency is the same thing, but it's a protocol for exchanging value. And what do I mean by that? Well, if I want to give you $5, I'm exchanging value with you, right? It's in the form of paper money. And what makes it hard to fake that paper money is there's a bunch of, you know, rules. It's printed on special paper. You can kind of tell if it's fake, right? And so with cryptocurrency, this is a digital protocol. How many of you have used Venmo? Right, so you've used Venmo before, you've used maybe PayPal, or you've used a credit card. That requires central institutions. So that requires maybe you go through PNC as your bank. Your bank is Northwest. My bank is something else. And you have an intermediary there. You have PNC Bank facilitates the transaction from your bank account to her bank account. And so, that's you know interesting, but cryptocurrency allows you to do that without any central institution or government in the middle. How many of you have used peer-to-peer peer-to-peer -peer file sharing before? So like maybe you downloaded a movie you didn't want to pay for, or you're not supposed to do that, right? You can use it legally, right? Say you want to download, uh, you know, you you're a computer science student, you want to download a copy of a Linux operating system to put on your computer. You can use peer-to-peer -peer file sharing for that. So for example, maybe you're seeding a torrent for, for Linux and you know, someone over there wants to download it, your computers just talk directly to each other. And that's what happens with Bitcoin or Ethereum. Is it allows you to send value to somebody else without having to have a central bank or you know, like the US dollar is issued by who, right? The US Federal Reserve. Why though? Like, why do we need this? We have Venmo, we have PayPal, you know, who cares, right? It's super easy to go and swipe my credit card at the student store and buy something that I want. A lot of us are used to kind of what you would call privileged banking, right? It's pretty easy for us here in the United States, uh, in a lot of countries, to walk down the street and get a bank account. You know, you show your two forms of ID or whatever, you get a cool card in the mail, easy. Not everywhere in the world has that. And so it's 
we there was this need in the digital community to be able to send money to anyone anywhere. So we kind of eliminate the issues of borders with money. It's an open digital financial system that anybody can participate in. So all you need is an app on your phone to participate in this digital economy. And so instead of having like, okay, we you know, have the US Federal Reserve, we have banks and that sort of thing, we have a community instead of developers, users, miners and stakers, right? You know, Megan mentioned proof of work, right? There's proof of stake consensus. There's even some other sort of consensus mechanisms emerging that allow us to decide, you know, the state of the blockchain. So I know this is a little bit high level, right? But does, does everybody kind of understand what I'm saying at it, it, that 10,000 foot view? Is it's just another set of rules that computers can follow that allow us to talk to one another, to participate in a digital economy. There's a lot of pros and cons to this. Um, so let's talk about some of the pros first. What makes Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin different than the traditional financial system? Well, for one thing, I think the most exciting part about it is accessibility. Maybe, what if you don't have a photo ID, right? What if you don't have a copy of your birth certificate? and you don't want to carry around cash and you need to send money to somebody, right? What if you live somewhere where the nearest bank branch is 100 miles away? Anybody can participate in the Litecoin network or the Ethereum network by downloading an application onto their phone or their laptop computer. A lot of places in the world have phones but don't have bank branches. Uh, in certain parts of Africa, there's a system called M-Pesa. It's not a cryptocurrency, but it's sort of like phone minutes. Uh, and what ended up happening with M-Pesa is the community started exchanging, send, you could text phone minutes to each other. So they started using this M-Pesa as a, as, a, as a currency system. And that's kind of what you get when you use Litecoin or Bitcoin. So as long as I have a wallet that can basically speak Litecoin on my phone, I can send somebody else that coin. And of course, um, I should probably say, there's different cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is kind of the biggest one. That was the first. That was the proof of concept and still the biggest name in the game. There's also Ethereum. Uh, I really like Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash for sort of daily payment type use cases, but there's thousands of them. Some of them have like two users. No, nobody really cares. But anybody can make one. Anybody can make a different cryptocurrency. Maybe you don't like the, the way that Bitcoin is set up and you want to make something that's different. That's how all of these different protocols have emerged. Uh, just like you know, some people like Google, some people like DuckDuckGo, some people like StartPage, or all kinds, there's all kinds of different search engines, right? Bing, I mean, I work for Microsoft. I, I know nobody uses Bing, it's fine. The other thing that I think is interesting that's, that really uh, is a practical, interesting point about crypto is uh, what happens when you go to the store and you use a credit card? I know they have chips now and that's sort of different, but generally when you go to the, the store and you use a credit card, you swipe it and you're giving the merchant your credit card number. And you have to trust them with that. Uh, anybody ever hear about the big target hack? where Target's payment database got breached and millions of credit card numbers got leaked. That sucks, right? You can't trust everybody. Every time you go to a merchant and you're using, giving them your credit card number, you're like, boy, I hope they don't use it to steal more money from my account. Cryptocurrencies use a push mechanism instead. Instead of giving them your credit card number and they uh, basically giving them permission to pull, you know, say $10 from your account because you wanted to buy a t-shirt or a book. Instead, the person that's receiving the cryptocurrency, so like if you want to pay me with crypto, uh, I give you a public address and you send the money to me using that public address. I could put my address on a billboard in the middle of Oakland and nobody could use that to take any money from uh, how many of you think your money would last very long if you put your credit card number on a billboard in the middle of Oakland? 
sure, sure some people would probably take your money. So that's interesting. And it's great for personal security. It's great for merchants too, because cryptocurrencies don't have chargeback. So if you come to my store and I sell you a t-shirt and you pay me $10, uh, you can decide for any reason, I'm not satisfied with this t-shirt, I'm gonna file a chargeback against you. And th that's an important consumer protection that exists. Uh, but you know, maybe you're just doing it because you want the t-shirt and you want your money. And that's not cool. That doesn't exist with cryptocurrencies. Transactions are irreversible, which has its cons, which I'll get to next, but it's an interesting pro in terms of businesses. Because of the decentralized nature of crypto, right? it's not controlled by anybody. There's no bank, there's no Federal Reserve. Anybody can use it, and nobody can really stop transactions between people, right? You know, in the file sharing example, you could legally do file sharing and share files that you have permission to share with anybody. Like all of my content is Creative Commons licenses. If somebody wants to put a torrent up of it and share it, I'm like, sick, more views. Uh, you can also do illegal file sharing, which is, the, which is you know, going against copyright law. Uh, but the thing is, is on a protocol level, when it comes to you know, torrents, that, that protocol, you can't stop it from happening. And cryptocurrencies exist in that same way. You know, uh, between you and me, nobody can stop me from sending you Bitcoin. So, of course, that does have its cons, but I like to think of cryptocurrencies as a very strong civil liberties tool. We need the internet in our society, in our democratic free society, to share information openly. And we can do the same thing with cryptocurrencies when it comes to value. Um, some examples of this, you know, you don't have to agree with everything they've done, especially in past years. One of the first adopters of Bitcoin was the organization WikiLeaks. Um, because, you know, they leaked information they thought should be uh, open in society. Uh, whether or not, you know, that was the right thing to do is of course up for debate. But their uh, ability to receive donations through mechanisms like PayPal was stopped. Stopped by banks, stopped by PayPal. So they, they threw up a Bitcoin address and said, hey, if you like what we're doing, send us Bitcoin. And they got a lot of money in Bitcoin. And when the price went up, they were able to continue you know, doing their sort of dissident use case, right? Um, Right now, in, in current events, of course, a lot of folks are talking about the conflict in Ukraine. And uh, the Ukrainian government Twitter put up Bitcoin and Ethereum addresses to receive donations from people all across the world uh, to support their fight. And so, you know, the important part of that was, is, you know, they had to make sure the addresses were verified and it wasn't like some scammer trying to get people to send them cryptocurrency. but. They, they don't have to worry about any kind of sanctions, blockades, those sorts of things. I you know, can donate to them. Anybody anywhere in the world can donate to them using cryptocurrency, which I think is pretty incredible. Uh, in terms of other use cases, right? something I find interesting, and let me know how I'm doing on time, too. Oh, yeah. I want to keep it kind of short so I can. OK, we're good. Good? Yeah. Cool. Um, what happens right now if you buy a car from somebody on Craigslist? What do you gotta do? You gotta go to the DMV for a notary. Who likes going to the DMV? I don't. We can have a future use case. Uh, so I'm old school. I drive like an old Subaru with a stick shift and an old Ford Ranger. My wife's got a Tesla because she likes that high tech stuff. Uh, it doesn't even have a key. I use this to get in and drive it. My phone has like a security token in it that I can use to start up her electric car and go drive somewhere. And in the future, maybe we don't have car titles anymore that you have to get notarized. Maybe instead you pay me in cryptocurrency and then I use the same app to send you the title to the car to your address. Now your address owns the car you get in, your wallet signs a transaction and you drive off. Kind of a neat thing to think about, right? So who's heard the term NFT? Anybody confused about what NFTs are? What, what's the point? That, so, 
in that, I love that practical example because that would be considered an NFT. It's a non-fungible, it's not like a dollar bill. Any dollar bill is worth a dollar anywhere. But it's uh, non-fungible means like, if I sell you my Tesla and I give you a Tesla key, you can't go like down the street and take somebody else's. It's the token that proves ownership of that specific vehicle. So the whole NFT art thing is like you have ownership of a, of a it's like a certificate of authenticity. You get to own the picture. I mean, even though anybody can like right click save as and download the picture, it's like having the original Mona Lisa in that space. I'm not super into that use case, but I can see why people find it interesting. So everybody loves, everybody in the crypto space loves to talk about it with enthusiasm. I do, I think it's really neat and useful. Uh, what people don't like to talk about that I'll talk about is the cons. What are some bad things about cryptocurrency? You know, I mean, it's a cool and exciting technology. It's like the internet, it's like social media. Everyone wants to come up and be like, this is gonna fix everything. It's not. <laughs> cryptocurrency has some cons to it and it has kind of its specific use cases like I talked about, right? Free and open exchange, it's a civil liberties tool. But there's some problems with it too. Remember that I said there's no chargebacks with crypto. Uh, when somebody sends cryptocurrency to another address, that money is the new owners, period. The only way that you have ownership of cryptocurrency is that you have the private keys. So you have like a, kind of like your car key, it's a secret, you know, random string of numbers. Uh, whoever has that has owns the cryptocurrency because you can now send it to somebody else. Does that does that make sense? Like, it's not. It's like cryptocurrency is a, you can't even hotwire the car. Like you have the key or nobody does. And so, people that do nefarious things, people that like to scam people out of their money, people that like to steal, they kind of like it for that use case because. You know, if a scammer tricks you into wiring them money, uh, sometimes the bank can claw that money back for you. With cryptocurrency, that's not the case. If somebody tricks you into sending them $10,000 of Bitcoin, uh, it's gone. And that's a problem because people do get scammed. Social engineering works. Um, I'm kind of curious about this one. Anybody ever have some like random person friend them on Instagram? and try to get them to, uh, oh, are you investing in cryptocurrency? Uh, invest with me. Those guys are all scammers, right? They set, they set up really cool, convincing looking websites and I've met people through my work that have lost life savings amounts of money to those kind of social engineering scams. And on the flip side, I have colleagues that work on tracking those people down. But that's a really unfortunate side of the power of cryptocurrency. It's, it's kind of a cliche to say, but with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, people lose keys. I mean, if you, you know, drop your car key in the in one of the sewage grates, sometimes you can get the dealer to make you a new one. If you lose your crypto keys, nobody can take the money, not even you. It's just gone, kind of out in the ether. So that's that's a problem. The other part is what do most people hear when they hear about Bitcoin? The price went up. I'm getting rich. The price went way down. I'm in trouble. I lost, I put, I invested $30,000 and now it's worth $15,000. I personally am not interested in investing in cryptocurrency. I use it just like normal money, like some savings, some cash. People have gotten really caught up in the markets, the fluctuation of Bitcoin, to the US dollar, or here into the US dollar. And that's been a real problem for some people because like any other sort of get rich quick scheme, some people say, man, I, wanna, I gotta get money in that, and then they get burnt by the market. It's very, very volatile, very. Like if you think stock trading is tough, crypto markets, I, I've seen in the time that I've been in the space, the value of a Bitcoin crater almost by half in a day just because of various factors. So that's something you have to be aware of and careful of. Uh, has anybody heard about environmental concerns with, with Bitcoin? 
So without getting super into the computer science details, a couple minutes? Yeah, a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, Bitcoin, the, the mechanism that Bitcoin uses to decide whose transactions are, are validated uses a ton of electricity, like small countries' levels of electricity. And, you know, of course, given that we have one planet to live on, uh, that can be a problem. There are other mechanisms that allow you to do that in a much greener way. And there's also some valid arguments that, you know, if everybody starts using Bitcoin, if it's widely adopted, the amount of energy that Bitcoin consumes uh, to secure it, the chain uh, that makes it so secure and unstoppable is worth it. It kind of depends on your viewpoint, right? You know, now it's kind of a niche thing that's using a lot of energy for a niche thing that not a whole lot of people use. So it's something that I think the community will have to continue to grapple with as it grows. The second largest cryptocurrency, Ethereum, which I think is an excellent project, uh, is moving away from proof of work to something called proof of stake, uh, which does not require massive amounts of energies and uh, is also a very secure way of you know, making it so that you can't like just say, oh, now I own all the Ethereum, uh, which is the point of these mechanisms. So again, overall, I think it's a really interesting tool. And I think it's just that, it's a tool, right? You know, I'm not you know, gonna come up here and say everybody should put money in crypto or this is gonna change everything. It's just another new and exciting piece of technology that we can use for good things. We can use it to exchange value with lower fees, with anybody anywhere in the world, and you know, allow more people to have access to the digital economy. I mean, I think accessibility is everything uh, when it comes to tech. So, I appreciate you guys listening to me, and uh, while I have a couple minutes, does anybody have questions? What is like the mining? Yeah, so mining, that's what, uh, that's proof of work. And essentially what that does is, so right now, uh, in, in short, right, if I send you money through PNC, PNC like checks that my bank balance, I have $5 to send you, that you have a valid bank account that it will be deposited to on the other end. Since this is a peer-to-peer -peer thing, uh, we have to securely decide who owns what. And so every 10 minutes or so, uh, people that are called miners running a special version of the Bitcoin software uh, batch process transactions. So they take like everybody's transactions for the last 10 minutes and decide you know, who's gonna get in, make sure everybody's following the rules. And the way that they make it so that that can't be tampered with is by solving really difficult math problems with computers. It, there's a lot of moving parts to proof of work, so don't be afraid to be confused about it. But essentially, uh, the network decides upon a difficulty for this problem based on the amount of people that want to mine. Does that kind of make sense so far? Are they a little people? bit. Yeah, it's people. It's just people running the Bitcoin software. Um, not every Bitcoin wallet is a miner, but anybody can be a miner. So. You get this specialized hardware, and you start doing guessing problems that it, that it basically can't be faked. It's using some special mathematical cryptography that's like really confusing, but super cool if you're interested. And uh, the more people that mine, the harder and harder that problem gets to solve. So that ups the security of the network. Talk to me afterward. I'll give you some better examples. It's a it's it's a really. It's a really hard thing to put in like a minute Q and A. Yeah, no. and sometimes looking at it digitally can help too. Yeah, because like yeah. you can see the, the way that the computers all mapping together and working together and, and sharing like information together too. Yeah, it's almost like a lottery, and the lottery requires the, the lottery means that the more computing power and electricity you spend, the higher your chance of winning that lottery is. Oh. And proof of stake uses something a little bit different, where instead of using a bunch of energy, is um, you have a higher chance you stake coins. When, when I say stake, I know I'm like using the word in the definition. It literally means you say, I'll put up my 32 Ethereum as collateral. If I screw up, if I get picked to validate the transactions and I screw up, if I let somebody break the rules, 
they'll uh, burn that Ethereum. They'll take it away from you. And the randomization process is, is a little bit different than with proof of work. So with proof of work, if you start doing things that are invalid, you're literally wasting your own electricity, which costs real world money. With proof of stake, uh, you lose the coins, you lose the value on the network. Like 32 Ethereum is like over $100,000 currently. So people that want to stake or participate in staking pools put up some amount of that towards one, one machine. And you know, they get to pick where the transactions go. But that's that's kind of a long question. Apologize for the no, thank you for rambling to answer. <laughs> Yeah, so what makes that is it's kind of like the value of, say, Microsoft stock or Facebook stock going up, is people see value in the technology. And, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of factors, right? I mean, I'm not an economy guy, I'm a computer science guy, so it's hard to say what makes the stock market go up and down. But people see all these use cases of Bitcoin. And in some ways, they also have seen the price go up, so more people want to buy into it. And it can go up over time because it's just all it means is people see value in the currency. So when you think of the, the market value of Bitcoin or Ethereum, just think foreign exchange trading. Like, that's, that's really all it is. It's not even a stock because Bitcoin's not a company, it's currency. So more people are saying, boy, I would rather use. Bitcoin than USD or Bitcoin than yen, and they trade for that. So you find somebody, uh, say, I want to sell Bitcoin, I want dollars, you trade. So, like, environmentally, I know you talked about real estate um, being a little bit better, but you also talked about, like, the more people. So what I mean by that is the current banking infrastructure uses a lot of energy that we don't see, right? It's fairly easy to quantify the amount of energy that Bitcoin uses because you can see on the blockchain the, the difficulty of the proof of work problem. And so you know how many like terawatt hours or you know exawatt hours or whatever of energy people are using to mine. We don't know how much money, uh, really, what the environmental impact is of PNC's corporate headquarters and the Federal Reserve and the diesel that all the armored trucks burn and so on and so forth. So what I meant by that was, is right now, Bitcoin's using a lot of energy for a fairly niche community of people that use it. If everybody in the world starts using it as currency, uh, it's still gonna use a lot of energy to secure itself but the amount of energy per person goes goes down in that in that perspective, right? So I mean, we don't know, you know, is the current banking infrastructure using as much energy as Greenland or a small country? We don't know. Bitcoin will still have that um, amount of environmental impact in the sense of like the more people use it, it doesn't make the energy requirements go down. It just means it's social. We may decide as a society it is socially worth it. Uh, kind of like how we decided it's socially worth it to, you know, have cars and airplanes to go places. Does that make sense? Yeah. What are your thoughts on the inevitability of governments just regulating the hell out of it? Because, you know, I used to work for a crypto um, company, and uh, we had a lot of KYC, and it was only getting worse. Yeah, uh, yeah it's going to be regulated. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, I mean, I'm not opposed to it, but, you know. The, the thing about the regulation side of it is what you're really talking about, you're not talking about regulating my ability to send you Bitcoin on the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin network. Regulations usually apply to the on and off ramps. Basically crypto banks, right? Anybody can use the, the protocol Bitcoin, but in order for me to trade US dollars for Bitcoin, I usually have to go through an exchange. Like Coinbase is one of the biggest ones in the US that just went public. They have banking regulations to deal with. And so that kind of does quell some of the fears because you do need to have some traceability for people that are using it for scams, fraud, money laundering. Um, I don't 
personally see the regulation of exchanges as a bad thing because it kind of helps deal with those problems. Um, the ability for the government to block me from sending you Bitcoin on the peer-to-peer -peer network is pretty much non-existent in a practical sense. Right? It's kind of like stopping peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Right? I mean, you could maybe figure out who I am and show up at my house and be like, yo, you broke the anti-Bitcoin law. But there's no real practical way to stop people from using it, if that makes sense. I think we're time. Yeah, did we have one more question? So, yeah, adoption is not super high right now for merchants, but it's getting better. Some people say, like, you know, you were asking about the prices. Some people see Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as more of an investment. I'm not super into that. I think people should use it. And there are a lot of online retailers that you can buy stuff from. Like I'm a jujitsu martial artist. Uh, I've bought like equipment for that using Bitcoin. I've bought books. Uh, you can buy all kinds of things with it. What websites have you used? Uh, so Bitcoin.com had a limited run of, of uh, rash guards and shorts okay. for, for that. So that was cool. Um, I still wear that rash guard at the gym and I love it. Uh, Books, I can't remember the exact website. There are websites too that serve as sort of like uh, directories of merchants that accept Bitcoin. Like uh, one acceptbitcoin.cash uh, pulls websites that accept Bitcoin cash, a fork of Bitcoin as, as money. Um, so there's not a super wide adoption of it yet as a currency, but you can. And especially peer to peer, right? Like. If I want to sell you a car on Craigslist, I would honestly rather take Bitcoin than worry about your $100 bills being fake or a fake bank check or something. Did that answer it? Yeah. So last thing, because I want to give the folks presenting their time. If anybody wants to try using cryptocurrency, um, go to your app store. Uh, this is one wallet that I know and use called Coinomi. There's nothing particularly special about it. Um, or you could use uh, any wallet that says Litecoin in it. Like maybe the Litecoin Foundation, I think, has an app. Uh, and see me after, and I'll send you like a dollar or two of Litecoin. Uh, Litecoin is just one cryptocurrency that's low fee and fast for payments. Uh, Bitcoin can be a little slow and expensive sometimes now. But I would love to show you how it actually works in a practical transaction. So I'll give you a little bit of money, and you can see how it see how it operates. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.